This is the price of freedom, a former Fox News star Bill O'Reilly wrote in a blog stating, the Second Amendment is clear, Americans have a right to arm themselves for protection, even the loons. While Hillary Clinton tweeted, we can and must put politics aside and work together to try and stop this from happening again. How can the US reconcile such different points of view? Well, the US ambassador to New Zealand is Scott Brown, a gun owner and a supporter of the right to be a gun owner, although clearly within the rule of law. Beyond offering thoughts and prayers, can America respond to this gun terror in a meaningful way? I wish it didn't happen at all, certainly. Uh, you know, we try to strike a balance back home where it's a constitutional right to carry and bear arms, as is the freedom of religion, the freedom of speech. Our founding fathers you know, put in place a mechanism so we have certain rights that go with us from birth to grave. And in order to change those rights, you have to go through a process. And that's like New Zealand doesn't have a constitution. It's one of the few countries in the world that doesn't have a constitution. We, we have one. And in order to change one of the constitutional rights, you have to go through a process. That's that check and balance. So when things happen, whether it's in free speech, whether it's in civil rights, we don't you know, react on one instance. We, we, we try to go thoughtfully and, and methodically through those changes. States have the ability to make their own determination as Connecticut did after Sandy Hook, as New York State has done, as well as other states have done, as Massachusetts, my former state, has done. Uh, I've taken and voted on uh, extending the assault weapons ban in Massachusetts, but it was done in a bipartisan manner with the gun owners and the, the advocates in place together in the same room working on a bill together, and that's how I think it needs to be done. You voted to extend the assault weapons ban? Yes. And that was particular local legislation in Massachusetts? Yeah, it was from right? the entire state, a yeah. And at odds with what the NRA was lobbying very hard No, for actually the Gun Owners uh, Action League of Massachusetts, was, which is a subgroup, they were at the table with us. They actually, because they got other things that were important to them when it came to hunting and, and other types of gun ownership rights. So there was a there was a a conversation like we're having right now. It wasn't like, this happens, That's th therefore that needs to happen. Everyone sat down at the table and it passed overwhelmingly. And um, and that was a good thing. Was it? You know, gun ownership and gun rights are very important, but there's also a balance of of, of protecting people's rights, but also protecting people's rights to, of people to be alive. So we try, we walk that balance every day. Can I look at the Second Amendment? A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Now, that seems to me to reflect 1791 and not 2017. In other words, that's anachronistic, isn't it? Well, the Supreme Court has had many decisions uh, most recently and will continue to make decisions on all of our laws whether it's this law or the free speech or freedom of religion. Uh, and I think that's appropriate to constantly review and upgrade your laws to fit with modern uh, situations in modern society. Do you society. think that stands? Do you think a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security Listen, of the first state? I, I, do you think that what, what that stands? means to people like me who are gun owners, I mean, I'm a gun owner. I, I want to have the ability to defend my home if someone, an intruder comes in who's not supposed to be there, who's going to hurt or kill my family. I want to have that right. Um, will I go and take that gun and go and kill people at a movie theater? Absolutely not, because I'm a law-abiding gun owner. Uh, are there people who have guns illegally that shouldn't have them? Absolutely. Take them away, throw them in jail, don't pass go, don't collect $200. Absolutely. But to take away the ownership rights of law-abiding citizens like me and others who treat and, and respect the Second Amendment and the right to carry and bear arms and the sanctity of life, I think that's, uh, that's, that's inappropriate. Is there a balance? Should those laws be reviewed all the time? Absolutely. Should they be modified and fixed? I'm all ears. But it's up to the citizens to sit down like I did in Massachusetts. And in each individual state and this, our country to make that determination themselves. So everybody has a seat at the table. Everybody has skin at the game, in the game. Is it impossible to get that balancing act right now? Because it seems to me such a tribal division. If you yeah. look, if you look at what's being reported in the Washington Post f f since this awful event last night, and that is the kind of money the NRA has spent on donations to Congress members, how on earth do you back up the truck? Well, I, I think it's easy because you know, uh, with full disclosure, the NRA supported me. Uh, I, they supported me in, in many of my prior elections. I think I, they gave me in, in one election about forty-two thousand dollars, and I, I raised a tremendous amount of money in my political career, but I was the most bipartisan senator in the United States Senate. And when there was an issue like uh, dealing on the, the gun issue, uh, 
you know, I just voted how I felt was appropriate. W were you compromised by that forty-two thousand no, dollars? No, I raised. We raised way too much money, so, and so, so did so, my opponent. So no. when you were voting on anything where the NRA would have a vested interest in you going a certain way, was there something in the back of your head thinking forty-two grand from them? No, with respect, forty-two grand is uh, is was in the political process in the United States. Certainly, it's appreciated, but you know my opponent raised a tremendous amount of money from you know the teachers' unions and the you know a lot of the other special interest groups. So you know you, you obviously, uh, I try to. I don't want to speak for any of my opponents, but you, know, you you try to do the right thing and you try to just read the bills, understand them, see how they affect your state, your country, your debt, and your deficit and vote, regardless of party. And there's no vote that I regret taking ever, ever, and I've taken. Probably over ten thousand votes in my political career. Easy ten thousand votes. So, at what stage will Congress be able to do what you described doing in Massachusetts, which is come together in a non-partisan fashion? Now, for me, yeah. from afar, that seems like mission impossible. Well, you know, you, you say that, but I remember after we had the terrorist attacks. Uh, obviously, when the twin towers went down, uh, I was most proud of Congress when they they got together on, on Capitol Hill steps and were arm in arm and, and worked together. Uh, to, to actually make our country do you, stronger. Do you think that's a possibility as a result of what's happened in Vegas? You know, I, I'm I'm a I'm a eternal. If you if you know anything about me, my mom and dad are married and divorced four times each. I lived in 17 houses by the time I was 18. Mom was on welfare, tough upbringing. I'm the eternal optimist. Okay, eternal optimist. So I'm always optimistic that people of goodwill, and there are a lot of people of goodwill in the in the United States Congress, Senate, and House who care very deeply about our country and about the people in our country that they will find some type of common ground to work something out. One final question. What would that common ground look like if you had your way? Well, it's hard to say. It's, it's really hard to say. We have, like New Zealand and, and like Paris, you know, uh, France, and you know, we all have very strict gun laws. We have laws, okay? First thing you need to do is enforce the laws. You need to make sure that you get all illegal guns off, off, off. I don't know if these are legal, illegal. See, I don't know the facts, so I don't want to assume. Let's assume that they were legal. Then the question is, well, how did you get them into the hotel? And was there a breakdown in security? Where was there a breakdown in mental? So I want to know what, what's going on, what's surrounding the facts. I know it doesn't make it any more palatable. Believe me, I do. Uh, but I want to under. I'm, I'm one of those people. I need to see it. I need to understand. I need to touch it and feel it. And and I want to. I want to make sure before I make a decision, I have all the facts in front of me. Every every time. Every, every time I make a decision. Uh, and I'm not sure if I have that answer yet, based on the fact pattern. Um, you know, I had thought that the gun laws in our country were were pretty rock solid, especially in my former state of, of Massachusetts and New Hampshire. It's there's there's more of a. Uh, um, outdoorsman type of New Zealand, you know, a lot of hunters, a lot of farmers, a lot of sportsmen, a lot of, you know, individual target practice people. I can't remember the last time we've had that type of situation in New Hampshire because you have a, a strong, active, uh, you know, gun owners uh, group that, you know, polices itself and makes sure that they, you know, they, they protect their rights, but they also respect and protect the environment when they eat what they kill, you know. It's, it's that sort of mentality in New Hampshire, and I can't speak outside of for the rest of the country, but when I see these types of things, you know, obviously it just, it just, it just destroys my heart, you know, it just makes me like almost cry. And, um, you know, I, I'm not sure what the answer is, I'll be honest with you, I, I don't. That's U.S. Ambassador to New Zealand, Scott Brown. If you were listening to that rather than watching it at the end, he did seem almost overwhelmed by the magnitude of the task that faces the U.S. trying to achieve the balancing act between gun control and the Second Amendment.